Anyone looking at the reaction to Chelsea's summer transfer window could be forgiven for being a little confused. Though Man United added Jadon Sancho and Cristiano Ronaldo and Man City brought in Jack Grealish, the media seemed united in their assessment that the Blues had followed up their Champions League win with the best window of any English side. That's slightly surprising given that Chelsea only made three signings this summer. Saul on loan from Atletico Madrid, backup keeper Marcus Bettinelli from Fulham and Romelu Lukaku. A world-class striker, yes, but one returning to Stamford Bridge for £103 million, more than three times the price Chelsea got for him back in 2014. But when you dig into the outgoings, you start to see what the journos were talking about. Only nine Premier League players were sold for more than £20 million in the summer of 2021, but three of those were from Chelsea, with Mark Guehi, Kurt Zuma and Tammy Abraham all changing clubs for big fees. They even managed to get £8 million for Davide Zappacosta, who joined Atalanta, and £4.5 million for 30-year-old Victor Moses, meaning that despite the enormous cost of re-signing Lukaku, the West Londoners managed to turn a £2 million profit across the summer as a whole. In fact, Chelsea have earned more than they've spent in three separate seasons since 2014-15, a period in which they've won two titles and the Champions League. So, while a sequence of excellent managers including Antonio Conte and Thomas Tuchel has been instrumental to their success, the foundations have been laid off the pitch by club director Marina Granovskaya and her recruitment team. So how do they do it? How has a club once renowned for its ridiculous and haphazard spending become one of the tightest financial ships in the game? Today on FD Explained, we examine what makes Chelsea so good at transfers. And if you've got something to add, drop it in the comments section for a chance to be featured on this week's Sunday Vibes. Starting around 2010, the club began to spend small fees acquiring youngsters, who they then sent out to develop at smaller teams around Europe. Early signings included Patrick Bamford, brought in from Nottingham Forest for £1.6 million, as well as De Bruyne, Lukaku and Courtois, who cost Roman Abramovich a combined £29 million. And while the hope was that some of these players would develop into first-team quality contributors, the system made money regardless, with these pre-peak acquisitions becoming more valuable as they matured, bringing in loan fees each year and eventually being sold on at a profit. It worked spectacularly well, and while the Blues of course made money on players like Mo Salah, they were able to earn big profits from lesser-known players too. Andre Schurle, Torgan Azar, Oriol Romeo, Stipe Perizza and Papi Gilaboji cost £30 million altogether and played a grand total of 99 games in the Chelsea shirt, but earned the team £28 million profit by the time they'd all left London essentially funding the signing of N'Golo Conte. This tactic became known as the Lone Army, and as time went on, its focus began to shift. Chelsea's youth teams were in the ascendancy, winning the Premier League's development competition in 2014 and 2020, as well as five successive FA Youth Cups between 2014 and 2018. And once again, the club turned to the loan system to maximise the value of their resources. Players were sent out to partner clubs like Vitesse Arnhem in the Netherlands, as well as to a raft of championship sides, putting some in the shop window and giving others experience of first-team football in preparation for joining the senior squad. And so, when Chelsea were hit with a transfer ban in 2019, they were still able to strengthen their first team by bringing in Rhys James, Mason Mount, Hikaru Tomori and Tammy Abraham, who, despite their lack of minutes for their parent club, already boasted an average of 88 senior appearances apiece. But the Blues' market savvy is not limited to loans. Just as Abramovich recognised Chelsea's money-making potential when he bought the club in 2003, both he and Granovskaya have spotted when unusual circumstances presented big opportunities and have acted quickly to take advantage. In 2020, as the Covid pandemic squeezed supporters out of stadiums and money out of football, teams began tightening belts across the football world. But while other executives braced for turbulence, Granovskaya and Abramovich embraced the chaos. Having made a £100 million profit in 2019 thanks to their transfer ban, the side was flush with cash, and the lack of money around Europe meant that there were more sellers and fewer buyers than normal, giving each pound better buying power than it would have in 2021 or 2022 when money started to flow back into the game. Chelsea promptly pulled out the black card and dropped a huge £222 million in the market, 80 million more than Manchester City, Europe's second biggest spenders. And while no other club in the world had a net spend of more than 95 million, Chelsea's was an astronomical 170 million, as they snapped up Timo Werner for below market rate, as well as bringing in Ben Chilwell, Thiago Silva, and Kai Havertz without significant competition. 
It was a huge statement of intent from the Blues, and the capture of Havertz once again showcased the club's opportunism, as rumoured suitors Real Madrid and Bayern Munich didn't have the cash to enter a bidding war, meaning Chelsea could swoop for one of the sport's most highly rated prospects, even though the squad already contained Werner, Ziyech, Abraham, Pulisic, Hudson-Odoi, Giroud and Mount. And when you can drop over £70 million on a player you can afford to bench, you know that you've conquered the transfer market. Thankfully for those of us who are not Chelsea fans, the Blues will need to find new methods to stay on top before long. Back in 2019, FIFA proposed new regulations on football loans, meaning that teams can now only send out eight players on temporary deals each campaign, a number which will drop to just six in 2022. For now, this only applies to over-22s and international deals, but the long-term plan is for national federations to restrict domestic loans in a similar way. And for a side like Chelsea, who farmed out 37 players in the course of the 2020-21 season, that will be a shock to a highly lucrative system. It will also reduce their ability to minimise the impact of mistakes. In the past, when Chelsea made a bad signing, like Tiemue Bakayoko or Michi Batshuayi, they were able to earn some of the money they spent back across the course of the player's contract. Bakayoko has been on four loans and is now in his second spell at AC Milan, who have the right to purchase him permanently for a fee of £13 million. If they exercise that option, Chelsea will only have lost £12 million on the Frenchman, having made back two-thirds of the initial £36 million they spent during the course of his loans, but they'll not be able to do the same next time. And while regulators are set on making life more difficult for free-spending super clubs, the Londoners have in the past made problems for themselves. Media criticism of Chelsea is often focused on their cutthroat approach to hiring and firing managers with incumbent Thomas Tuchel their 10th coach in 10 years. And that high churn, a product of Abramovich's demand for immediate success, means that talented youngsters have often seen their chances limited, as managers under pressure prefer the safety of experience. As a consequence, several stars have slipped through the club's fingers, with Mohamed Salah, Kevin De Bruyne and Lukaku three of the most high profile, though the side did make a profit on all of them at the time. And with Tammy Abraham and Fikayo Tomori departing this summer for reasonable fees, it's possible another Chelsea product turns into a superstar over the next half decade and embarrasses the hierarchy which let them leave. It could also be harder for Chelsea coaches to succeed over the next 10 years if Abramovich continues to run through them at the same rate. Thanks to the loan system, the club has always had a huge number of players on its books at the beginning of each season giving new bosses a reasonable amount of flexibility, with enough varied talent at Cobham to play almost any style or formation. Kurt Zuma went from loans at Everton and Stoke to playing more than 2,000 league minutes in each of the last two years. Marcus Alonso fell out of favour under Frank Lampard, who preferred a back four, before re-establishing his value under Tuchel in a back five. And Andreas Christensen has gone from playing just 600 minutes for the club three years ago to being a key performer in the side's second UCL triumph. Without the power to loan out fringe members of the squad, Chelsea will be forced to sell more of these players than before, reducing their depth and making it even more likely that they will lose out on stars of the future. We'll see how Granovskaya adapts to the challenge. Having simply outspent their rivals in the first phase of Abramovich's ownership, Chelsea responded to the arrival of other mega-rich superclubs on the international scene by becoming smarter, and their eye for young talent and skill at finding suitable loans have made them one of the best and most profitable clubs in the world. As the loan system becomes more limited, they will be forced to find different ways to make money and will need fewer of their signings to miss but the work done off the field has primed the side for long-term success. Of the 18 squad members to get more than 1,000 league minutes last season, half were 25 or under, and 55% of their goals were netted by players in that same age group, suggesting that the core of this side is here to stay, while the academy is likely to continue producing interesting prospects, with Billy Gilmore, Trevor Chalaba, and even hudson Odoi all yet to have a significant impact at the highest level. The club's clever dealings have taken them from Chelsea, widely hated new money upstarts, to respected members of the football aristocracy in under 20 years. Who knows what the next two decades could bring? So that's our take on why Chelsea are so good at transfers, but what do you think? Let us know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell, and you'll never miss an upload. We'll see you next time.